Today, we're talking about signal-to-noise ratios. What are they, and why are they important? Stay tuned. Picture an experiment we might conduct. Previous studies have shown that there may be some cognitive benefits and uh, emotional benefits to reading literature. So I, as a psychologist, might decide that I would like to create an intervention that would encourage people to read more. Now, I've been thinking about this, and one of the things that might be a problem, a barrier to getting people to read, is simply accessibility. So I'm going to create an app, and the app is going to go and find uh, classic works of literature that are uh, now public domain, and it's going to combine them into a nice package, and it's going to allow people to have more access to books that they can read. And I hope that that will increase their book reading. So if we were going to do this as an experiment, our dependent variable, the thing we care about, is reading. And so we want to measure how much time they spend reading. And the independent variable should be one group that gets the app and the, another group that doesn't have the app. So I'm going to take a group of 100 people. I'm going to randomly assign them to either the experimental or the app group or the control group that has no app. Then I'm going to measure the amount of time they spend reading over the next month. Now let's say I do that and I get my results and I see that my app group is slightly higher in terms of average reading time than the control group. What can we conclude from this? Well, it would be nice to be able to say that my app made a difference. However, we know that we have different people in each of these groups, and any two groups of people are going to vary on any measurement we might take, at least a little bit. And so the chances that they would be exactly the same is basically zero. So how do we know if our difference is due to real, actual differences between the groups, or is it just due to random chance? Maybe we just accidentally got more, you know, better readers in one group compared to the other. So we need to be able to separate the signal, that is, the difference between the groups in this case, due to our intervention, my app, so the increase in reading based on the app, from the noise, the error, the differences that you see between samples just simply based on random chance. Now the words noise and error can be used interchangeably here. And I have several other videos that might uh, be useful if you're wrapping your head around these concepts. One is the video on the uh, law of errors, and the other is the video on sampling distribution. So I encourage you to check those out. Most inferential statistical tests are ratios of some measurement of the signal to some measurement of the noise or the error. So understanding the concept of signal-to-noise ratios can be useful in understanding how these hypothesis tests work. So what is signal and what is noise? In my video on the law of errors, I explained that when we take a measurement, it consists of two parts. It consists of the true value of the thing we're trying to measure and some error. What the statistics do is they compare the amount of signal to the amount of noise to give us a value. If that value is large, it means that there's a lot of signal relative to the noise. In high signal-to-noise ratios, the signal is easy to detect. In low ratios, on the other hand, it's harder to detect the signal. Let me go through some examples, and hopefully this will help illuminate the general idea of signal-to-noise ratios across a lot of different situations. The first example I'd like to talk about is simply actual noise. If I whisper quietly, you can still understand what I'm saying, as long as I'm in a quiet room. Sigh versus sigh, ASMR edition. The minute I go into a room that's full of noise, like a noisy, crowded restaurant, my whisper isn't going to cut it anymore. 
Even though the signal hasn't changed, the background noise has, and that makes it harder to detect that signal against all the background noise. So what do I do? Naturally, I start talking louder in order to overcome all the background noise that's trying to wash out the signal. You see, it's not about the signal, and it's not about the noise. It's about the relative levels of signal to noise. You need to have enough signal to overcome the noise if you're gonna be able to detect that the signal is there. Let's look at a couple of examples that are not related to sound specifically. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some examples of high signal to noise ratios on the left and low signal to noise ratios on the right. So first up, let's look at a tiger. On the left, we have a high signal to noise ratio tiger. Wow, that tiger really pops. You can see the tiger really well. A lot of tiger, not very much noise. On the other hand, on the right side, you see low signal to noise ratios at work. So there's a same amount of signal, it's still a tiger, but in this case, we have a lot more noise. We've increased the amount of grass, and now that tiger is darn near invisible. This is how Where's Waldo works, by the way. The Where's Waldo books takes Waldo, who's the signal, and fills the pages up with all kinds of visual noise and then asks you to find the signal. The more noise, the longer it takes to find Waldo, and apparently that's fun. Let's look at another example. I'm gonna show you some pictures of M&Ms and I'm gonna ask you whether there are more red M&Ms or blue M&Ms. Okay, so let's look. On the left side, are there more red or blue? It's easy to see that there are more red M&Ms. It's easy to distinguish that there's a much larger number of red M&Ms compared to the small number of blue M&Ms. The signal of number is really strong. On the right side, however, uh, it's a little more questionable. The numbers are very similar to each other, so we'd have to count. How many blue M&Ms do we have? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight red M&Ms. So because those numbers were really similar to each other, there was very little signal to come through. In this case, the difference in number of M&Ms is the signal. When the relative number of M&Ms is bigger on one side than the other, then it's easier to distinguish than if the two numbers are similar. For our next example, I'm gonna show you the data collected from two groups. On the left side, we have group one that has 10, 9, 10, 10, 11, and compared to group two, which has two, one, two, two, two. Okay. Question is, is one of these groups higher than the other? I think it's easy to see that group one has higher scores of whatever this is uh, compared to group two. That's because uh, the average is higher in group one and group two, but there's something else we're paying attention to as well. You may not realize it, but you're also looking at how spread out these data are. In group one, all of the data are clustered around nine, 10, 11, right in that range. And in group two, one, two, it's all ones and twos. So they're uh, all clustered around that. On the right side, however, we have values on, in group one ranging from three to 12. So we have three, seven, 10, 12, five. In group two, we have 11, one, five, two, eight. And the question is whether or not there's a difference between these groups. Well, the average between these is gonna be a little bit lower, but also the amount of noise in each group is gonna be higher because there's more variability within the group. So these data are more spread out and that's gonna make it harder to detect a difference between the two. Now we can use a t-test as an example. I'm gonna make a future video about exactly how to calculate a t-test and what all the pieces are, but for now, just know that the t-test is a signal to noise ratio. The signal in this case is the difference between the means of the two groups, so the average of group one and the average of group two, and we're gonna come divide that by something called the standard error of the mean. If you wanna know how to calculate a standard error of the mean, 
that will be explained in my sampling distributions video. Okay, so if the signal is the difference between the means, x bar one and x bar two, so we're gonna take x bar one minus x bar two, that's the signal, and then we're gonna divide by the standard error, that's the noise, then that gives us some numbers here. The difference between the means is 8.2 divided by the standard error, which I calculated out to be 0 0.37. That gives us a value of 21.92. Okay, what about on the right side? Well, the formula is the same. We're gonna do signal relative to noise. The difference between the means in this case is two. The standard error is 2.48. So, Notice we have a smaller signal. We went from 8.2 down to two, and we have more noise from 0 0.37 up to 2.48. So not surprisingly, the number you get when you divide is gonna be much smaller. So in this case, we have 0 0.81. So remember, I said in high signal to noise ratios, the signal is easy to detect, and in low signal to noise ratios, it's harder to detect the signal. Remember, in null hypothesis significance testing, we're gonna need enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis if we are going to change our beliefs about the world. This signal to noise ratio will tell us the strength of the evidence. If the signal to noise ratio is low, that means the evidence is weak. We can't confidently say that there was a difference beyond what we would reasonably expect do just to random chance. On the other hand, as the signal to noise ratio goes up, the probability that this result is due to chance goes down. This is why in most statistical tests, as the value of the calculated statistic, such as T or Z or F or chi squared, as that value goes up, the P value associated with that value goes down. So if I plot these on a distribution of all the possible values of t, and I map it onto the probabilities of getting those outcomes, you'll notice that the probability of getting t of a 0 0.81 is 0.44, which is actually a pretty common thing to observe. On the other hand, the probability of observing just due to chance a T of 21.92 happens at P less than 0.00001% of the time. So this is a very unlikely outcome. So when we're looking at whether or not there was a remarkable or significant difference between these groups, in the right side sample, we had very little evidence, weak evidence, to suggest that even though one was numerically higher on average, it didn't seem to be outside the realm of possibility that it's just due to random chance. But as you go to the left side, where the signal to noise ratio was much higher, 21.92 when we put numbers to it, then the probability of observing that outcome just due to chance was very low. There's two ways to boost the signal-to-noise ratio. You can either increase the signal or you can reduce the noise. In the case of collecting data, you can do this by collecting more data, adding new participants. This is sort of analogous to uh, asking your friend to repeat themselves if you didn't hear them the first time or listening to something again if you aren't sure what they said. By gathering more information, you get a more representative sample making it easier to detect smaller differences relative to the noise. In summary, signal to noise ratios are everywhere. They're important to everyday psychology because even though you may not notice it, they are important to determining your ability to perceive stimuli, detect changes in your environment, and make decisions. Signal to noise ratios are important in statistics because by using what we know about probability and the normal distribution, we can formalize this process to weigh scientific evidence. I hope you'll keep these ideas in mind for the next few videos in this series on basic inferential statistics. Here's hoping the signal exceeded the noise in this video. Until next time, 
keep thinking. Hey, you know what's fun? Pushing buttons. So why don't you push the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, help us grow our channel so we can get the word out and help as many people as possible. Thanks.